Hello and welcome to CompScience Simplified. The topic for today's video is throttling and debouncing. You might have seen programmers throw around these terms casually and might even have acted like you know what they mean. In today's video, we get to know what the terms actually mean and also implement our own throttling and debouncing functions in JavaScript as a bonus. In simple terms, both of these are mechanisms for rate limiting, which means if you want to control the number of times a particular event happens in a given interval of time, you rely on these mechanisms. Let's start with throttling. Let us assume that there is a diner. Also, assume that it has quite a small number of seats and hence can only service three customers per hour. And thus, if you were the owner of that diner, you would tell the guard at the gate to not let in more than three customers per hour. Or in other words, one customer per 20 minutes. Let us say that between 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., if two people visited the diner, the guard would let all of them in. But between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m., if five people visited the diner, the guard would only let three of them inside during that hour and let the extra two people in only after 10 p.m. This is exactly what throttling is. It is limiting the number of requests you serve in a particular interval of time. If we look at it from a programming perspective, we can apply the same logic to invoking event handlers that we applied to admitting guests into the diner. The number of guests would be the events that are getting triggered, while the number of guests that actually entered the diner would be the number of events that actually fired. We might do this in real world to reduce the load on the server by cutting off a few extra requests in that duration at the client itself. The above graphic shows the same in a visual format wherein the filled circles are the event handlers that got executed while the empty ones are the ones that did not get invoked because we are throttling at the rate of 3 events per duration. With that in mind, let's move to debouncing. This time, let us take the analogy of an auction house. Imagine that a painting is getting auctioned. The auctioneer waits for someone to bid. And once someone bids, the painting is not sold at that moment. The auctioneer waits for some more time, a cool off period, for instance 5 seconds, which allows the next bidder to place a bid. If another bid is made, the cool off period resets and then the auctioneer again needs to wait to see if there is another bid coming. Finally, if that period ends and there is no additional bid, it is only then that the painting sale is confirmed. Also notice that all the bids that were made before the last one are not processed, just the last one is and that too after the cool off period. Applying the same analogy to the programming world, when we debounce an event, we don't process or handle it the moment it occurs, but rather wait for a cool off period to see whether another one is going to get fired. If it does, we again wait for the same amount of time and only when the cool off period ends and we do not see another event, we process the last one. An example of this can be seen while handling the user text input. When the user is typing in a text field, we motivate him or her to type the entire word or sentence by waiting for a few more milliseconds after a character has been typed to see if the next one will get typed. It is only when we see that the cool off period has passed after the last typed character that we process the full string typed by the user. Here's a graphic which represents this visually. The hollow circles indicate the events that got fired and the filled circles represent the actual time when the event got handled. With those concepts cleared, it is now time to implement both of them in code. Let's do it. Implementing debouncing is very easy. You just need a set timeout and a clear timeout function. Here's the code that gives us the debounced version of a function. It accepts the function to be debounced and also a delay in milliseconds. Whenever the function is called, it just clears the last timeout that has been set, if any and then it goes ahead and sets another fresh timeout for the function with the given delay. This tells the JS engine to invoke the said function after that delay if it does not get cleared within that time. And as a result of this, we get one execution of the debounced function for several invocations that are closely spaced together. Let us now implement throttling in a similar way. We will be throttling a function so that it does not get executed more than once in a given time limit in milliseconds. Here's what the function that returns a throttle version of the function would look like. We use a boolean called waiting to signify whether we are in the waiting period after a function has been called once. 
If we are not in the waiting period, we execute the function once and then set the waiting boolean to be true. Also, we start a timeout to again mark the waiting boolean as false once the wait time is over so that the next call to the function gets executed. This makes sure that the throttled function does not get executed more than once in the throttling duration. As simple as that. And that's about it for today's video. Hope you learned something useful. See you in the next one.